Sure, thanks for having me and uh, hopefully you'll find some of this interesting. Um, if you have questions, uh, I feel free to interrupt or however you normally do it, um, but I'm happy to answer questions as I go through or um, you just let me know. This is you know for you guys, so make it enjoyable for yourselves as much as you can. I apologize, I have two screens going, which I'm not used to. So if I'm looking at the wrong screen like I am right now, I'm <laughs> just making a mistake here. Um, but uh, so to get started, I'm a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the chair of the Boston Grotto. Uh, I'm the head or one of the co-founders of the Cave Exploration Society. Uh, which is a new group that uh, myself, uh, Adam Weaver, Lee Gray Bowes, and Ender um, Uslaglu uh, started uh, about a year ago uh, in order to support our own expeditions, but also to support other expeditions and other research that's related to cave and car sciences. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about how we formed it and uh, some, maybe some of the benefits and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and also just show one of our, our biggest expeditions, which is in Cuba. Um, we were supposed to be there in April, but uh, the, the COVID-19 virus really uh, threw a wrench into our plans. Um, so we've had to reschedule that expedition till uh, the day after Christmas. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that's probably happened to quite a few people. Um, with expeditions getting res uh, rescheduled. But uh, one of the things I do wanna say thank you to the NRMG for, for supporting the expedition. They, they gave us a grant last year. So I guess this is part of our way of repaying the debt. Um, so uh, we'll talk about the caves of Cinco Pesos, uh, which is an area in central Cuba and Santo Tomas caverns, which is uh, the second longest cave in Cuba. Uh, Santo Tomas is, or was measured at 47 kilometers long. Um, but in reality, I think by the time we're done resurveying, it, it's going to be closer to 60 to 70 kilometers long, if not substantially longer than that. Uh, they are incredibly spoiled in Cuba. <laughs> and if they have to duck or bend their head or squat, they don't consider it passage and they don't survey it. Uh, most of this cave, you could drive a golf cart through it without any issues whatsoever. Um, it is just big, big, big passage uh, and really well decorated. Uh, and I'll show you some photos and some video of it. Um, it it's unique because it's a, it's a national heritage site in Cuba. There's a kind of a, love-hate relationship between the caving school that's on site and um, the Cuban government wanting to um, uh, to bring in money so they're allowing some private tours to happen in the cave uh, as well as now there are some illegal tours happening in the cave and, the, and there's been some damage to the cave um, so we'll if we have time we'll talk about some of the the things that we're, we're doing to try to help uh, the Cubans out to protect their cave system. Let's see, so uh, <clears throat> the picture here on the left, can you, if somebody can, uh, can you see my, uh, my mouse pointer swirling around on the screen? Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so the picture on the left is, uh, is the Valley of Vinales in, like I said, uh, oh, central southwestern Cuba. Um, it, it's absolutely full of karst. To me, it reminds me of some of the, the karst in Vietnam or, or China. Um, but there are these large, uh, back, these large outcroppings that pop up all throughout the valley that are just chock full of caves. Um, it, without trying, you can, as you're driving down the road, you can spot caves at 60 miles an hour. Um, they're literally everywhere uh, in Cuba, um, or if, in this area anyways. Um, we were sponsored by the uh, Cuban Caving Society uh, and their Academy of Science. Um, so 
got to you know send a, a huge shout out to them because without their support um, we would have never been able to get into Cuba to do the to do the research to to do some of the surveying and exploration. Um, Cubans and caving have gone together for almost uh, since the the beginning since prehistory. Um, in Santo Tomas, there are uh, extremely old archaeological sites where uh, people were living in caves and hieroglyphics. Um, there are other areas that were uh, inhabited by slaves that had run away, uh, where you can see where they built fires and, and where they were living. Um, and, and the military has a very, very long, strong history of, uh, of using caves, both for the, the revolution of, uh, what was it, uh, 1959, when they took over uh, from Batiste. Uh, they, used, um, they used the caves to kind of to do guerrilla warfare, and they, and they still use it. And I think I have a couple of pictures of, um, of them in caves. Um, down on the, the bottom right is uh, the actual, this is the best map of, of Santo Tomas. Uh, about a decade ago or so, uh, they had a large flood that went through, um, went through the, the uh, Spilio Center and destroyed all of their records. Uh, so this one is hung up about uh, five feet on the wall, so it survived. Um, there's, there's really, there's a, a very tiny scale down here. Um, I, I mean, it, it's probably like a grade two map at best. Um, some of it's color coded based off of the levels. There's eight distinct levels to Santo Tomas. Uh, one of them is still active uh, and there are a few areas where it sumps, but otherwise it's primarily a, a fairly dry cave. Um, I guess, especially compared to some of the Alpine caves in Montana and the, the Midwest or uh, the New England area. Um, some interesting things, Cuba has about uh, 11 million inhabitants uh, and, and most importantly, a bottle of rum will cost you about 13 cents in Cuba. Um, it, it's one of the, it's cheaper than water there. Um, and, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, you can that's for their their local rum you can spend a lot of money on overpriced rum but the the, the local stuff uh it comes in a plastic bottle and it's pretty darn good uh especially after the first liter of it so uh this is in uh one of my my favorite statues this is in downtown havana uh and cuba is all about land of contraindications or contradictions excuse me um, it's like you said, it's been inhabited by for a little over 6,000 years. It's controlled by the military. They are supposed to be staunch uh, communists, but now they've started to allow some um, free trade to happen. Uh, they've outlawed religion for many years, expression, um, art in some ways, yet there are large statues like this in downtown Havana. Um, they have two currencies. Uh, one of them is, is for tourists, and it's worth uh, 24 times the the currency that the the locals are actually paid in. So what it does is it allows currency to come into the country and be worth a lot for those that have it, which is the government. And then when the government goes to pay their workers, which is everybody, um, they're basically getting 124th. Uh, the actual value of the of the currency, um, so it does make Cuba uh, the poorest country on earth by uh, by a substantial amount. Uh, the average Cuban makes about ten to fifteen dollars at most per month, uh, and that would be the equivalent of U.S. dollars. So you'll see what they can do on a shoestring budget is incredibly impressive. Um, most Cubans work two, three, four jobs to support themselves uh, because they do get a, a ration booklet, uh, which allows them free free groceries, but it's not enough to even survive on. Um, so let's see, caving in Cuba. Um, so this is part of Santo Tomas. Uh, this part is in an area called Cristales. Uh, and, and like most of the cave, it is very, very highly decorated. 
Um, there's some sections that have soda straws that are two and three meters long or tall. Um, but I guess before we talk about kind of the US's involvement, we should look back a little bit. And um, it was actually the Romanians that started the first uh, kind of uh, speleological program with Cuba. Uh, the Romanian Speleological Society just celebrated its 100th year anniversary this year. Uh, so they've been going at it for a very long time. And they were some of the original um, communist countries uh, before the, the Iron Curtain fell, of course. Um, and then for probably the past 20 to 30 years, the, the Italians and Swiss have done a lot of caving in Cuba. Um, and there's been some some NSS members that have done a, a good bit of uh, caving, Joel Despain, uh, Pat uh, Cambaesis, um, Dave Bunnell, um, and quite a few others have done quite a bit over the years. Um, I, I know, I don't think Dave has actually been in Santo Tomas, but he's done photography for quite a few other caves there. And there's a lot of very pretty caves. Um, I'll, kind of now, um, people are always asking me, like, can we go to Cuba? Can we go caving? What's the process? Um, and two uh, basically pre-Trump, it was pretty simple to go. Um, all you had to do was get on a plane, you show up, and you could generally go caving as far as the, the Cuban government was concerned. Um, relations have deteriorated a bit, um, and now, we have to get uh, scientific visas from the Cuban government to, to go caving in, in, in Cuba. Um, and that takes about 140 days of, uh, of applying before we'll get an answer. Uh, last year or two years ago when we went, um, we received our visas on the day before our flights. Um, and that meant I actually had to fly down to Washington DC to pick them up. Um, Cuba likes to play games. They don't like to cooperate even though they want help. Uh, it's just one of the unique challenges of, of caving in Cuba and dealing with governments um, because they control everything. They control where you go, um, where you go in Cuba, where you go inside specific caves. Uh, they want advanced notice, even for Cuban citizens, um, because of all the, the military activity in caves. Uh, they they um, they won't let you just kind of show up and, and walk around, which is. Um, pretty unique. Um, I've never been in a communist country before being in Cuba. Um, and, and it is, uh, it, it's, it's eye opening to say the least. Let's see. So, some of the K fauna, uh, I've got a couple pictures here of it. Um, there, Let's see. Um, what's unique here, there are crustaceans that have been calcified over. Uh, and it's not just one or two, there's dozens and dozens of them in this one area. Uh, I'm not sure what happened, if they're all dated to the same um, same time period. But uh, like I said, there there's quite a few of them. Um, Cuba has at least uh, four to six endangered bat species. Uh, there's endangered frogs, or uh, just Santo Tomas Cave has four, four to six endangered bat species. It has endangered frogs. Um, one of our expedition members is searching for a thought to be extinct bat species, but he's found recent um, bat skulls inside owl pellets that indicate that they're still around. Um, so the NSS is supporting his research um, as well as uh, another one of our uh, members um, is studying a, an endangered Cuban bat, or I'm sorry, a Cuban frog uh, that's also um, funded by the NSS. And then there's, of course, the ancillary creatures. There's lizards, there's, um, there's scorpions. Let's see. There's uh, decent sized tarantulas that will shed their hairs um, if you get too close and you tick them off. Um, Apparently, um, this hand, he, they didn't mind this hand. Um, this is uh, one of the, the smaller endangered frogs that are being studied. Um, I don't know the, um, 
the scientific name of it. Um, but what's unique, they, these spend most of their time in the cave and they only come out to, to reproduce a couple times a year, I believe, during the rainy season. Um, up here is a large land slug. Uh, it's about the size of your hand and apparently they're edible if you're hungry enough. Um, we never got that hungry in Cuba, um, but they're just, they're huge. I've never seen slugs that large. Uh, let's see if this video will play, hopefully. So that was the, the approximate moment that I got histoplasmosis, which was really fun uh, about two years ago. Um, thankfully, nobody else in the group got it, but we were, I forget, either going into or out of the cave uh, in, the e uh, in the evening and all the bats were, were going out to feed. Um, and I've never seen that many bats before. There was at least 10 to 15,000 in that one uh, mass exodus. Um, there's uh, tens of thousands of more bats inside the cave. Um, but it was it was pretty interesting to, to experience something like that. Um, obviously, white nose is not a, a major concern from that for them because uh, the bats don't hibernate in Cuba. It's obviously warm enough for them to, to be active all year round. Then, um, make sure you have your video or your, your sound up for this because it's kind of an interesting sound here. Um, this is the, the mating calls of the, the endangered frog that was on the person's finger. So were you able to hear it? No. Nope. Here, I'll try one, oops, hold on. Let's go back, I'll try one more. Turn your sound way up. You'll hear a, a, a very loud chirping. Hopefully, were able to hear it. That was Carlos, uh, one of the local cavers getting lost, um, <laughs> coming out of the cave. Um, he ultimately had to come back. Um, but uh, So uh, let's see. Last year's expedition, we spent the, the equivalent of 133 days underground when you look at total man hours. Uh, there were 15 cavers. Um, from one to from just three different countries, we had four donkeys and one and one dog. Um, thank goodness we had donkeys for the first part to transport gear. Um, I know you guys use them for scapegoat. Um, I would love to know how much you pay for to rent out donkeys for that. If you have somebody um, that has them and donates them, we had to pay for the donkeys and. For two round trips, we paid four cents for, for all the donkeys, so it wasn't too bad. Um, and they were charging us extra because we were basically white gringos, um, and they knew we had expensive gear, so they thought the donkeys could, uh, should earn more. Um, let's see. Right, so first part of our expedition was spent uh, in Cinco Pesos, which is a, a very, very small mountain village, um, about an hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes uh, west of Havana. Um, we oops, right, had some pretty simple goals for the first time being there. We were looking to, to find new caves. Uh, we knew there were some um, some caves that the, uh, this farmer had discovered about 30 years ago, and he was willing to take us back there if he could find them. Um, 
we were trying not to die and we came pretty close. Uh, well, we succeeded, but we came pretty close to dying uh, at one point. And I have a couple of photos of that. Um, and then to also resurvey uh, two known caves uh, to help them out um, because they just don't have the equipment. Um, I had asked one of the cavers if they um, if they're able to to do survey when we're not there, and they said no because uh, it's been at least twenty years since they had a working um, tape measure there to actually pull and to do surveying with. So um, it, it's it, it's impressive that they're able to do you know a fraction of what they're actually able to. Um, but um, this is at the, the farmer's uh, little farmhouse. Um, his name is Tomas, not to be confused with Santo Tomas, the cave. Um, these are cacao pods, which is where chocolate comes from. Um, and if you've ever get the chance to eat them, oops, sorry, uh, eat them off the tree, I would highly recommend it. It's a sweet uh, white custard that's inside. Um, you don't eat the seeds, which you actually turn into chocolate. This tastes like a cross between an apple, uh, an apple, a pineapple, and uh, just a silky custard. They're absolutely outstanding uh, and everywhere in the jungle. Um, and this is the entrance to one of the caves that we discovered. So uh, here we are pulling up. Uh, this was our, sorry, I'll get this figured out eventually here. Uh, this was our main mode of transportation, uh, rather old vehicle. And all along all the roads in Cuba, there are these just little houses or shacks that pop up. And it's where you either get dropped off or where you get picked up. Um, people, uh, th there's no national transportation system. Um, and vehicles are outrageously expensive um, compared to what other people can afford. So the, the, under, the understood rule is if you see somebody standing here, you, you stop and pick them up, um, you know, and that's just how people get around in Cuba. Uh, there's no time systems, um, you know, or anything like that. Um, and then on the right are us loading up the donkeys and uh, getting ready to head to about a two, two and a half hour hike into the jungle um, to get to Tomas's farm. All right, so yeah, this is, this is uh, Mr. Tomas. Um, he's, his stove is a couple pieces of very large rebar with old worn out uh, metal files on them that he uses as pot holders. Um, and he just kind of adjusts it as needed. The table that he's cooking on is made out of wood uh, and it's just filled with ashes. Uh, and that's kind of a typical farmer's house. Uh, there's no windows, there's no glass in any, any of the windows. Uh, it's a dirt floor, uh, you know, one room house. Um, and this is one of his, his outhouses where other people stayed in. Um, um, this gentleman here, his name is Hilario. He's one of the, I guess, he's not one of the founding members, but he's most one of the most uh, well-respected members of the, the Cuban caving community. Uh, he's in his 80s and he goes caving every day by himself. He's never been married. He just enjoys caving more. So he'll go wander around and find caves day after day. Um, now that he's getting older, he's getting a little bit of Alzheimer's. So he, um, his schedule isn't as regimented. He came to the expedition a couple days later because he got lost, uh, which happens pretty frequently, apparently. Uh, but he was there, he was very interested to know what we were, you know, what we had discovered. And he was uh, just a lot of fun to be around. Um, and then these are two of the cave maps that we were there to, to redraw them. Um, again, I'm not trying to pick on the, the Cuban cave maps, but 
they are obviously lacking. Um, there's little scale, little detail. Um, it's nice, some of them are, are actually dated. Uh, there's no direction on them. Um, but what's surprising is uh, in this part, they're pretty nice pits. Um, the cave on the right has a, and these are in meters, so it's a 51 meter single drop. And then this one, this cave on the left has no scale on it. So I think in total it was about 130 or, uh, no, about 120 meters deep where the cave on the right is about 140 meters deep. So it's pretty respectable, um, especially for being on an island where you would think it would all sump out um, pretty quickly. And then, so, um, from from Tomas's house every day we would go hike up through the jungle. Um, the, these were the best trails that we could uh, that we were on, and every day Tomas would lead us um, to where he thought where he either knew where there were caves or where he thought there would be caves. Um, and uh, as you can tell, this was the day we were looking for the cave that he found about thirty years ago, and it's nice and sunny out. And by the time we got to the entrance of the cave, it had turned pitch black. So it, it took us a while um, to actually find it, um, but we did. Um, and it went from really nice hard limestone um, that's a pleasure to bolt to poor quality. Um, what's unique is that the, the black here is, uh, is oil coming uh, or a tar coming out of the rocks. I don't know if any of your caves out that way have it, but uh, you can you can actually smell the oil. Um, and I've only seen that in, in Italy before. Um, but what we ended up discovering is a really nice uh, fault line um, that just seems to go and go and go. And the farther you go down, you go out along the fault line, the deeper it gets uh, and the wider it gets. So we started to, to install some anchors um, as we went out. And then the quality of the rock gets really, really poor, as you can tell here, um, but it got big. So I went down with like 60 meters of rope um, and, and dropped it in, in about as, with just three or four rebelays um, and I had, called up to, to send more rope down because it just kept going. There was another huge, huge ledge that was going to go down even further. Um, and then we had a, a chunk of limestone come out. Um, in this picture, it didn't come out yet, but it was somewhere over here about the size of a, of a pretty big microwave. Uh, and the spit anchor uh, split the rock and the whole, thankfully, it, when it pulled the rock out, it split it and it bashed it against the uh, the sides and just kind of disintegrated because I was below it. Um, but it was the the only time I've had a, a spit anchor fail on me, and you can tell it was installed correctly, um, correct depth and everything. But uh, as soon as uh, this poor gentleman actually got on the uh, put his weight on it, it it just pulled right out and collapsed, uh, which was a, a unique experience being underneath it. Um, and then having to climb back up and out um, after the, after hearing all the, the, the crashing rocks. Um, so we didn't finish this cave uh, last year. Uh, there's still a lot more to explore on it. And we'll be back in uh, December with some substantially longer bolts. Um, I'll, kind of way out here, it turns into much nicer uh, rock, but it's all covered in flowstone. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll bring some, some pretty long uh, screws that will go into it and hold hopefully much better um, than, uh, than some of our other anchors were, because uh, with flowstone, it's pretty soft. Um, but we, while looking for this one cave system, we found three other new caves that were what looked to be just as big um, and we'll be going back there uh, like I said next year or this coming uh, December and then let's see 
that was our group. Um, this gentleman's from Turkey and part of the Boston Grotto. Uh, that's myself. And then all the rest were, were Cubans on this part of the, the expedition. Um, we, as I explained earlier, we had some issues getting our visas. So some of our members couldn't make it uh, last minute. Uh, and then there were another six or seven people that were coming for the second week of the expedition, which I'll show you pictures from, you know, right now. Um, but just kind of a, a typical, you know, vignette of the of the valley. Very, very pretty. Right. So here, Santo Tomas. Uh, we had a couple of goals here: uh, create an actual management plan for the cave, uh, geolocate the um, the 26 entrances to the cave system. Um, GPS is illegal in Cuba. Uh, no phones are supposed to have it. Uh, thankfully, they don't check. So we did. Uh, we were able to locate all the entrances and install. Um, a, last year we located all the entrances, and this year we'll install stainless steel placards to, you know, uh, to start all the surveys from. Uh, because previously they were just tying ribbons, and within you know, a few months, everything would get washed away or eaten. Um, we were, this upcoming expedition will be building a, a water treatment system for the village. And, let's see here. Uh, and then we'll be conducting a full biological inventory of the cave system. It's never been done, uh, uh, as far as I know, by any cave, in any cave system in Cuba. Um, and we're working with Servant Sarbu from, he's a Romanian uh, living in the US and he's kind of heading that up. Um, I wanted to point out uh, their ingenuity. Um, if you can, I needed to plug something in at the, the caving center and somebody grabbed me an extension cord. Uh, and this is their actual extension cord here. And if you look, it's just regular cat five line that they're using as an extension cord. Uh, and they could not understand why I didn't want to plug into that uh, and charge my very expensive headlamp on that. Um, but they just will braid a couple of the, the cat five lines together and they call it good enough. So as long as you don't draw too much uh, current, nothing usually burns down. Um, this is their electrical, uh, their breaker box, which is outside. It's exposed uh, and made out of wood and has a bird's nest built into it. Uh, and all the, the wires are live um, and not on fire. Um, this, this was their source of clean water until it, it got flat tires and they can't afford um, to, to fix them. So they've been drinking water that's come out of, um, that comes directly out of the cave. And unfortunately, one of the, uh, the water systems is, uh, or I guess just upstream of the insurgents is a, is a chicken farm. So um, the water is not very clean to say the least. Um, so that's why we wanted to build something that's actually pretty substantial for them. Uh, it's been causing a lot of problems for some of the older villages, uh, villagers uh, in the area because of um, all the pollutants and bacterial growth. And um, yeah, so uh, like I said, this is the best map of Santo Tomas that they have. Um, every arrow is a, is a cave entrance. Um, it's a for scale, it's about eight or nine kilometers from left to right and maybe three roughly two to three kilometers from top to bottom. Um, the, the yellow are collapses inside the mountains. So as you are going through the cave, you'll come out uh, into the sunlight, but you'll be completely trapped by, uh, by these very large cliffs that come all the way around. Um, and, and it's, it, they're, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet long. Uh, and some of the cliffs are, you know, anywhere from 50 to three or 400 feet tall. Um, so you're just kind of trapped inside until you find uh, another 
um, another exit point. Um, there we go. So uh, Santo Tomas is probably best known for its cave cancer. Um, it is literally everywhere. It will rival uh, some of the best caves in the US or in, in Europe. Um, and, and this is considered only the, the third nicest cave in Cuba. Um, there are other caves that have much, much larger crystals and, and some larger formations. Um, the largest stalagmite, I believe, in the world is in Cuba, and it's something like 39 meters tall, I think, for freestanding. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't have scale, but it's, it's well over a foot long for the, for the horizontal halactite. Uh, there are rooms that are just filled. Um, this is from a passage called Vela. Um, we were, were, were surveying in here and we thought uh, on multiple occasions that the, um, that the passages would end, but it's just very large columns that you actually have to walk around. Um, and, and some of them are, uh, oh gosh, uh, probably 10 to 15 feet in diameter. So they're, they're nice sized columns that are just strung together. Uh, here's another section of it. Uh, again, it's, these aren't walls. There's passages that go all the way around uh, and it's just kilometer after kilometer uh, of passage like this. Uh, and some more, some more halectites. Uh, some lily pads, which are, which are kind of pretty. Um, I'm going to show a quick clip of, uh, of one passage. I'm going to fast forward through some of it. Um, I apologize, uh, YouTube didn't render it fast enough, so it's not in full depth. Uh, but let's see if we can show some of it just to show you the, the sheer scale. And I shot this on a cell phone camera, so um, it's certainly not the best. But let me see if I can point out a few things for scale. And uh, as I'm walking through this passage, I'm trying not to destroy everything uh, as I look around. But this went on for about a thousand feet or so. And this is all walking passage. None of this is crawling. So it's pretty decent. So again, I won't bore you with it, but it just keeps going and getting better and nicer and, and bigger. Um, oh, uh, let's see, how many slides do I have? Oh, just one more, uh, perfect. So, you know, after all this, um, you know, as the, the expedition has grown, um, you know, the course of a couple of years, uh, five years now, it started out kind of as a, as a family trip. And then just as a grotto recreational trip. Uh, and then two years ago, it was an actual expedition. And then this year, uh, we'll have cavers from seven, seven countries and a total of 35 cavers on it. Um, we decided to, to actually incorporate as a, as a nonprofit to support the expedition uh, and to support other expeditions because we saw kind of a need to, to not only help ourselves, but to, to help other cavers and to encourage other cavers uh, to, to go out, do more project caving, to do more, to do more expeditions. Um, so we started a, an organization called the, the Cave Exploration Society. Um, now we have, um, our, our board is made up of cavers from the US, Turkey, Lebanon, uh, France, Italy, and Cuba. Um, we're directly involved in, 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 obviously in Cuba, we're supporting uh, an expedition in Turkey uh, where we're 
exploring a, a newly discovered cave that's right now at uh, minus 1,200 meters deep, uh, and it's still getting deeper. Um, and, and by support, we're obviously we get to go caving there, which is great. Um, but we're lending them equipment. Uh, they have about a hundred of our hangers and uh, stainless steel hangers installed in the cave. Uh, we brought about a thousand feet of rope last year uh, that they needed. Uh, we brought uh, extra anchors, of course, um, you know, to, to support them because it is outrageously expensive to, to rig caves. Uh, and previously, they were derigging the cave every year. Uh, and so every time you rig and derig, uh, you know, about 3,000 feet, uh, it's actually at 4,000 feet now, um, we would spend uh, a week to week and a half rigging it and then another week derigging it. And it was absolutely awful work. Um, so now we're able to help them out. Uh, and then this coming year, we're uh, co-leading uh, an expedition to another area of Turkey called Batman, uh, which is just a, a great name for a karst region um, that's on the the Iranian uh, uh, the Iranian border uh, where there's some uh, where there's a lot of karst and we think there's some pretty good potential there. Um, so what we're what we're also doing are we're doing research. Um, I'm sure some of you are uh, have. Um, been exposed to either LIDAR or photogrammetry, um, and we're using that to kind of document caves. We're working with manufacturers to improve the accuracy of it. Um, right now we can, with one of the, the LIDAR scanners, the accuracy is about two to three centimeters over the course of a, a couple of kilometers. Um, and you can scan as fast as you can run through a cave. You can scan all of it. Um, which is pretty incredible. I apologize, I didn't bring any, any scans from it um, to show, but obviously it's all in 3D. And if you have enough light, you can record uh, video and overlay the video um, over the 3D scans in real time on a laptop inside the cave, which is pretty neat. Um, so it's come a long ways. I've seen guys kind of make their own LiDAR uh, scanners, which is incredible. Um, what we're using is a LiDAR scanner from uh, Great Britain. Um, and then what we're trying to do is support uh, other expeditions that we're not part of. Uh, so what we've done is um, on our website, we sell caving gear. Um, and then anybody, if an expedition uh, basically applies for our support, we'll either donate the gear or we'll uh, sell it at cost. So we're one of the few companies that carries Raumer and climbing technology gear. Uh, we co we carry Bial, we cover Edelweiss, uh, we carry Kong. Uh, so a lot of the, the European manufacturers that are a little less known in the US, um, but it allows us to support ourselves by selling it to the general public or to general caving. Um, and then, like I said, support other expeditions. Um, so certainly if there's ever a chance that you wanna get involved and you need help, um, you know, we'll, provide free of charge, you know, mentorship guidance, um, access to the gear. Um, well, if you want to, if your expedition is larger and you're thinking about doing a, actually incorporating as a nonprofit, we can help you walk through the steps of it, uh, which can be a little bit tricky, uh, but it's really not too, too bad if the, if your needs are large enough, otherwise we'll help you kind of use our nonprofit status. Um, and we can do that through getting you some some grants and, and kind of helping you with that. Um, let's see, bear with me here. Uh, I'm actually missing a slide. Uh, sorry about that. But I did want to talk about grants and some of the more unique resources for sourcing gear for expeditions because that's always your biggest expense. Um, our by getting a, by incorporating as as a nonprofit, it's kind of opened us up to a lot of grants, and we're able. We were surprised at the number of grants that are available in just random communities, and we've searched uh, not just the Boston area where we're located, uh, but almost every bank that we've talked to has grants for for science. Uh, there are grants through employers. Uh, my wife's company that she works for. 
is a pharmaceutical company. Uh, they'll they'll do a, a matching one to one grant uh, at up to five thousand dollars. They'll also contribute. Um, they'll pay her to go caving uh, up to three days a year. They will give her uh, if she sits on a board of a nonprofit. They'll pay an extra twenty five hundred dollars in in grants for free, um, and they will. Uh, she can if she volunteers for I think thirty hours throughout the year they'll contribute an extra fifteen hundred dollars in grants to the nonprofit. Um, so I would encourage you know people to to talk to either their employer or the employer of one of their spouses or of their spouse uh, because there's a lot of um, a, a lot of potential there and it's not just large companies there are some small companies out there as well. Um, Home Depot will give you a grant up to a few hundred dollars on the spot for as a nonprofit for for equipment. Um, if you have a bigger need they'll review it and it takes a little while but any store manager will basically cut you um, uh, will give you one to two hundred dollars worth of gear. Um, let's see sorry. Uh, Target uh, will give you grants. Um, Costco is easy. They'll give you like fifty fifty dollar gift card uh, if you have a nonprofit to, and you can buy uh, buy food with it. Um, and let's see what were the other big ones. Uh, oh, Patagonia. Um, you don't even have to be a nonprofit if you stop in one of their stores. They will generally donate a pretty substantial amount of clothing to your organization uh, if it's going to good use. Um, and what happens is when clothing gets returned, it generally doesn't go back on the racks. It actually just gets put aside to be donated. Um, so we've, a couple of years ago, we brought, uh, I think 20 or 30 kilos worth of clothing to Cuba that was all donated. Uh, and that was before uh, we even incorporated as a nonprofit. Um, so there are plenty of sources out there. Uh, and I'm going to put some links on our website um, that, have a, that have all the grants for specifically for science, uh, the grants for food, uh, and anything like that. Um, so I hope people will find it useful. Um, I'll throw a shameless plug that if you are looking for gear for yourself and you want to check out our website, go to caveexploration.org slash gear uh, and you see what we have. Um, and if you are buying it for your expedition, let us know in advance and we'll definitely help you out as much as we can to get you the gear at a good price or, um, or free if you need it, you know, talk to us about it. Um, 